on this episode of Imagine a World. I guess the hope is that people will think more critically about everything, about the systems, about the technology, but then also recognizing that, you know, everyone needs to be a part of this. And we don't want just the people that are hyper tech focused and working on technology involved. It's very much like voting. You think that you're one person, your vote doesn't matter, but in actuality, it's like, no, if you and everyone else thinks like that, then it does affect things. So it's very much getting everyone involved and making sure that everyone is thinking about this. Welcome to Imagine a World, a mini-series from the Future of Life Institute. This podcast is based on a contest we ran to gather ideas from around the world about what a more positive future might look like in 2045. We hope the diverse ideas you're about to hear will spark discussions and maybe even collaborations. But you should know that the ideas in this podcast are not to be taken as FLI endorsed positions. And now, over to our host, Guillaume Reason. Welcome to the Imagine a World podcast by the Future of Life Institute. I'm your host, Guillaume Reason. In this episode, we'll be exploring a world called Crossing Points, which was a third place winner of FLI's world building contest. This team put a lot of thought into how new technologies might work alongside human nature, rather than trying to change us directly. The most advanced AI systems in this world are extremely large and expensive to run, so are mostly limited to political and corporate use. Crossing Points has a special focus on exploring how simpler tools are experienced by a range of diverse individuals. There's an emphasis on the unanticipated impacts of new technologies on those who weren't considered during their development. From urban families in Indonesia to anti-technology extremists in America, we're shown that there's something to learn from every human story. This world emphasizes the importance of broadening our lens and empowering marginalized voices in order to build a future that will be bright for more than just a privileged few. This world was created by a diverse team of five living in the UK. Our guests today are Elaine Cech and Vanessa Hanschke, both PhD candidates at the University of Bristol. Elaine has a background in art and design and is studying the accessibility of technologies for older adults. Vanessa is studying responsible AI practices of technologists, using methods like storytelling to promote diverse voices in AI research. Their third teammate, Tashi Namgyal, is also a University of Bristol PhD candidate who is studying the controllability of deep generative models. The remaining team members are Dr. Susan Leckelt, who researches the applications and implications of emerging technologies at the University of Edinburgh, and Nicole Ogston, a British civil servant delivering welfare policy to UK citizens. Well, hi, Vanessa and Elaine. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so I'm curious, first of all, how the five of you on your team came to work together on this project. So um, I think Tashi was the one who first spotted um, the competition for the Future of Life Institute. Mm. And Tashi, Elaine and I, we all do our research in the same lab. Um, so the Bristol Interaction Group. So that, yeah, that's how we know each other. And then we were like thinking about who else to pull in. And um, Susan and Nicole, they both did um, their undergrad at Edinburgh with me. So I knew them and I knew they'd be sort of interested. And Nickel's like more of the policy person. So we needed him. So all of all the rest of us were kind of in the human computer interaction mm. space. Um, and yeah, Nickel, we pulled in f for some politics knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about your particular skill sets? Uh, I guess... Thinking about me and Susan, we're both more in the sort of creative side of things. So my background is in art and design. And I know that Susan has been doing a lot of um, creative informatics. Tashi also is kind of in the creative sphere. I think he's our sort of musician in residence, I guess. Cool. Artist. Yeah. Yeah. He does music and AI stuff. Yeah. I saw he's doing like music from people's doodles, which is very cool. 
Yeah, that yeah, that was his like last project, but also like in the AI space. Yeah, yeah. And I do kind of research in responsible AI. So thinking about making it more ethical and thinking about how to take all the kind of responsible AI work that's based on guidelines and very abstract mm -hmm. just now and taking it into the more concrete. So um, yeah, that's how I fit in. How would you say that your personal perspectives, like like where you live or your your educational backgrounds, have influenced how you think about the future? So that that's really, I think, part of why we came together to do this is because we all were coming from sort of diverse backgrounds. So I, if you can't tell from my accent, are am American. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in the U.S., but then I did my master's in Japan. Um, I know Vanessa is very multicultural. She's from I'm going to let you talk about yourself. I'm not going to talk about you. <laughs> You're right here. Well, yeah, I am I was born in Germany. I'm like half German, half Indonesian. That's why I like brought in that Indonesian yeah, story. Yeah, that makes sense. But I've like lived in several places like, like Elaine. Now I'm studying in the UK and yeah, I've lived in Cameroon. I've worked in Italy. So I, it was quite important for me to kind of see the like little stories that actually mm. happen all around the world and kind of think of things in a more decentralized way as opposed to like humanity always going into one direction but actually there's many things going around that don't feature so often like the big media landscape yeah The world of crossing points looks pretty different from our own, with AGIs debating philosophy on TV and hybrid 3D printed meats in grocery stores. But the people in this world are still basically the same. There is still a dazzling array of languages and cultures which shape our attitudes toward technologies. Our hopes and dreams haven't fundamentally changed, and neither have our blind spots and shortcomings. I wanted to hear more about how the people of crossing points navigate their new world, and how AI tools manage to help so many of them flourish. How do people find fulfillment in your world? Like, what's a good life like? Mm, yeah, I think there's kind of like two aspects to that. So there's one that we kind of brought out, which was like the self-expression side. So people like to be creative. And I guess it's something that kind of exists now as well. Like they try to improve themselves and become better. But then on the other hand, we also thought that like the social side was very important. So if technology takes over a lot of the burden of work, then ideally we would also have more time to engage with each other mm. um, socially and help other people and mm. volunteer maybe. Yeah. Yeah. One big factor in your world you describe is the spread of personalized AI tutors that kind of helps people do this personal growth and connection stuff. The most popular one you describe is skill jump. And it's this system that basically gets to know you and then recommends new things you should learn to try to reach your goals. I really like this one's origin story. It kind of started as a corporate employee training system, but then it gets taken over by an activist collective when the company goes under and kind of becomes like a tool for the people. But I'm curious to hear more about how people in your world actually use this. Um, like you're saying, things have really changed. You know, you have universal basic income and many jobs can now be automated. So what do people actually aspire to? What are they trying to to do with their lives with these tools? Yeah, I think they they try to go um, above and beyond what people could actually do before. So one of the ideas was that it was a bit like an immersive system with VR and like the whole world is kind of open to you, kind of like, you know, the internet, but in a lot more immersive way. And it also would take away your physical limitations that you might have. And so we were thinking of all kinds of hobbies and creative stuff that people would explore without the physical limitation of where you can actually go and what your body could actually do. Yeah. You mentioned people like rock climbing in VR with like muscle feedback and stuff like that. Yeah. So in your world, AGIs are fairly rare, mostly because they have this huge scale. They just, it turns out they require a lot of processing power in your world. And so there's a lot of associated costs. They're heavily regulated by a UN consortium. And so they're mostly used in industrial and governmental contexts. Like there are AGI oracles in the US and EU that help to predict policy outcomes. 
But I'm curious how people outside of these uh, contexts relate to those AGIs. Like, what do they know about them and what they're capable of? Yeah, I think what you described there is actually like quite an important part of how we view AGIs, like the fact that they're big resource consuming things, because I think that in a lot of the like AI conversation right now, imagines AI just being everywhere because it's something Mm. that lives in the cloud and just like magically does things for you. But actually... (laughs) this technology is like all rooted in a material sense. Like it, yeah. it lives in a data center, which like consumes a lot of energy. Um, I don't know, ChatGPT apparently took a hundred million dollars to just train. And yeah, ChatGPT is nowhere close to AGI yeah. yet. <laughs> um, so how, how much would anything else kind of like consume? Mm. It's kind of like the state or the economy. People like know about these things and interact with those AGIs in like a limited sense in very defined settings, but it's not like they're always interacting. Like they know them, but they don't necessarily have a specialist. Like a personal like, connection. Yeah. 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 Another theme I liked in your world was how mm. diets have shifted. So you have most meat products now being hybrids of lab grown and plant-based materials. They use like AI assisted gene editing to develop new textures and flavors. So there's this stuff called chicken, which is this really popular combination of chicken and bacon. Sounds great to me. And you cite an outbreak of bovine diseases in the 2030s as kind of speeding along this transition. I'm curious how this shift in diets has affected the way people think about animals, if it has. I mean, I think something that is sort of a theme throughout our world is that we don't really see a whole lot changing in human behavior. (laughs) Because I think things are very gradual. And I think we kind of even thought about this as the shift towards animals thinking about like whale meat that's consumed in Japan. Um, It's very common and normal Mm. in some areas. So especially amongst like the Ainu, uh, indigenous people of Japan, eating whale meat is cultural and very accepted. But, you know, the majority of the country is like, no, let's not do that. (laughs) So I think there is always sort of these shifts that occur with our like attitudes toward animals. But like the people who are diehard, like, the vegans who really care about animals and animal cruelty will always be there, but I don't think you're going to have like a mass change of people's yeah. minds. Interesting. Crossing Points embraces humanity in all its diversity and looks for the solutions that human nature presents alongside the problems. It shows that there's something to learn from everyone's experience and that even the most radical attitudes can offer insights that help to build a better world. I wanted to hear more about this human-centered, inclusive approach to problem solving, and how it allows the people of Crossing Points to create a world where so many of them can flourish. I really appreciated how your world focused so much on like kind of unconsidered perspectives or under-considered perspectives. Um, people who we don't often think about when we're developing AI technologies and systems. There's still this ongoing struggle for accessibility and inclusion, Like in one of your short stories, there's this Indonesian grandpa who complains that this super advanced AI healthcare tool that he's using still doesn't understand his dialect. I'm curious to hear some of the other approaches that are being taken in your world to tackle these issues. So my my research is working with accessibility and accessibility of technology. And I work with particularly older adults Mm. and older adults who have dementia. So I think I'm very hyper aware of the the limitations that technology even currently has in terms of accessibility and inclusion. So I think knowing how the limitations are now, you know, there's this constant sort of need to create accessibility and accessibility is still sort of oftentimes a second thought or something that has to be built mm-hmm. after the product is built. I think it's hard to see that going away in the future, which is really sad because, you know, if you make something accessible to one group, it tends to make it accessible to everyone. So there's really no reason to not have accessibility designed and built into these systems that we're creating. But we live in an ableist society. And so that really keeps this stuff from happening. And this sort of is why we continue to have these failures of accessibility and inclusion. Can you imagine a future where 
you know, as you're saying that the rising tide lifts all boats in this accessibility area, like mm-hmm. what if AI systems were able to give us that foresight and consideration? Could could we imagine a world where there aren't as many accessibility issues or is this just something kind of inherent to any technology? That is a tough <laughs> one. Um, actually, I think this one I'm going to kind of turn over to Vanessa because I think, Vanessa, you you really work with sort of getting companies who are creating these AI systems to think about inclusion and think about the ethics. And I think that's part of where we need to go if we want this to happen. So, I mean, the the way that I see that AI is just now is is that it's being trained on usually historical data. And so kind of being trained on the world as it is right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I find it, I, I struggle to imagine a world where it could m- overcome most of those challenges. I mean, it's it's the way I also, <laughs> I guess I would see it in my research where I'm like working with developers who, to f- reflect on their technology. And then sometimes I'll hear them ask, oh, so are we are we there yet? Are we like ethical <laughs> now? <laughs> and I think it's the same with like accessibility is like, are we there yet? Mm-hmm. Are we in that accessible world? Although it's like a continuous process where we are sometimes redefining also what we think and learning. So I can't imagine us arriving at that big goal. We probably have to continuously be open to engaging and reflecting and, and questioning and what will the accessibility needs of the people of the future be? We, we don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you you brought up an excellent point of like constantly needing to be questioning and aware and constantly changing our views. I mean, I think in any science, we're constantly reevaluating and renegotiating what our theories are, what our, our hypotheses are, that sort of thing. And I know from the accessibility standpoint, we have moved from sort of the medical model of how we approach technology design and how we approach even you know, medical care to more of like thinking about an independent approach Mm -hmm. to now even thinking about sort of this interdependent approach where it's people are interconnected and there are reliances that occur whether you're able-bodied or not able-bodied. Yeah. Interesting. And I guess even when things aren't designed with certain groups in mind, Mm. people sometimes just like appropriate technology in different ways and then just make them their own and and manage and in in ways yeah. i can't even imagine yeah. i don't know if you have a good example of that Elena. i just can't I do, think of I it do. <laughs> made me think of a great example so there was recently someone did a research project and um the paper was called my zelda cane and it was looking at you know in video games there's not a lot of accessibility games created or games that have those sort of accessibility elements but people would hack the games. So for instance, The Legend of Zelda, they would use their sword and they would hack at things to kind of know where they were in space. So very much like how people with visual impairments use canes, they would use their sword like a cane. That's fascinating. So yeah, yeah, I love that. Great research, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so sometimes people will just make it their own. You won't even have to have someone to imagine what what it could be. Yeah, Yeah, right. Although that's not to say that accessibility should not be designed for. They'll figure it out. (laughs) They'll figure it out, but maybe like let's actually make it more inclusive. (laughs) So in your world, there's this huge impact on the labor market from AI and robotics technologies. One of your uh, other short stories has this household robot that can do all this different types of labor, like cooking and cleaning, even harvesting these plants that are being grown in the attic. And it seems like the people in this house really just need to delegate. There's not much else for them to do physically in the house to take care of things. Um, And the devaluation of manual labor in general that results from this in your world leads to the manual labor revolution. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about this revolution and its impacts on your world. So I want to shout out Susan because she was she really made a great point about this. You know, technology has historically been partial to automation. So the creation of the microwave, the creation of the washing machine, sort of all of these home appliances and this home appliance boom that occurred in the 20s, the 20th century led to the decrease in household labor. And so a decrease from almost 60 hours a week 
in the 1900s to 18 hours a week by 1975. Wow. So that led to this change in the workforce. So, so this is one reason why we see more women in the workforce is because they don't need to be spending all their time at home necessarily doing these domestic mm. tasks. So I think being one of three women on this team, <laughs> we, we do very much think about this feminist perspective on automation and the impact on society. But that then also means that we have to think about sort of the invisible labor that occurs. So oftentimes when we have technologies that are created to promote automation, that creates sort of this invisible labor, which means that someone has to maintain it. Someone has to be the one, you know, doing the updates. Someone has to be the one who, you know, makes sure that it's plugged in and it's charged. Mm. And again, this, this labor tends to fall on women and carers. I think the the idea we had there kind of came from asking the question, where are we going with all of this when mm. we're like automating different tasks that humans uh, usually do? Then we we kind of need to rethink about what kind of tasks are left for the humans and um, and how how should we reshape the way that people then work? Mm. Yeah, that. That reminded me. Yeah, we did. We did think that like one of the, the major sort of results of having this manual labor revolution would be greater expansion of UBI. And I think we tried to look into, well, where are there already sort of cases of UBI working and sort of thinking then if this becomes that some people will not have jobs, how do we become a sustainable society and how do we you know, sort of think about how we can take care of each mm. other. Yeah, I, I really like how your world kind of takes human nature and tries to work with it so much. You know, I, there's a really big dose of kind of psychological inertia in there that I think is is, is true <laughs> <laughs> for how we respond to things. And mm. one example of that is how you approach reducing global conflicts. So you have this AGI system that dis- decides where to put stockpiles and trade routes and it kind of puts them in key locations to try to reduce geopolitical tensions. Um, of course, now controlling this AGI that decides where stuff goes then becomes a focus of conflict in itself. But the AGI sees this coming and it creates this virtual war space where countries can like compete for shares that give control over how to update the AGI. And I thought this was a really interesting twist on like how to curtail some of our worst instincts and kind of shift the game through AI. Can you say a little bit more about how this whole system works? So, so we have to give credit where credit is due. This is definitely Nichols' baby. Cool. Um, so our political person, yeah, of course. That makes sense. Um, so it definitely was kind of. I'm not exactly sure where Nickel was coming from, but when I've read what he's talked about with this sort of virtual war space, it kind of is. We know that humans come with an aggressive nature. It's our evolution. It's just kind of. It's gonna be there. So having sort of something that is going to give people stakes Mm -hmm. where there is higher stakes is some way that you can actually sort of maybe mitigate that aggression. Because like I was talking with Vanessa earlier and we talked, you know, the Olympics was supposed to be sort of that kind of thing where it's this global competition, nonviolent as a way of kind of being like, ooh, who's the strongest country? Uh, I never thought about that. Can you say anything about how, like, what what does the virtual war activities involve? Is it like a game of some kind or like? So we had Nickel give us like a a rundown of what he was thinking. And it sounded very much to me like betting on sports. (laughs) So if Russia and China were in a war and it was, okay, everyone in this virtual space has a share, they can put it towards either China or Russia whoever they back and then that can give them sort of virtual assets that they can use to combat each other in this world. It sounds a bit like a big Um, game of risk. Is that sort of in the right (laughs) ballpark, you think? Mika loves risk. Maybe that's why. (laughs) Oh, there you go. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) But but I I think you're right. I think you're right. I, I I'm sure he was thinking about risk and like other ways that we can kind of mitigate against you know our violent nature yeah i'm curious kind of from this more philosophical level 
you know, some of our other winning worlds have technologies that let people change themselves directly, like become different types of people, have different desires even than they had before. What are your thoughts on like what parts of human nature can or should be changed and, and which ones we should try to work around in this way? Yeah, I think, I think Elaine, you said it before, like, I don't think we really saw humans changing so much as one. We have a very diverse world there where there is no like one human nature and like not one kind of human that will be in the future. I think if anything, we wanted to preserve human nature, maybe. Yeah. To me, that almost seems dystopian where it's like, if I was to change my will, if I was to be like, well, I don't want to be so altruistic. I want to be able to make a lot of money mm-hmm. <laughs> and just turn off that that part of my brain that is like, don't use people. It feels like it would be a bit, I don't know, inhumane. No, I really appreciated this this angle that your team took on of like, let's change the things around us and and see if we can make things better in that way rather than trying to change ourselves. That's an interesting approach. I feel like this also gets into some conversations about ableism, as you were saying earlier, this idea of like, we should change the affordances of our environment and the way that our society is built to make people's lives easier the way they are instead of trying to like, quote, fix people. Yeah, for sure. Well, even though technologies in your world don't try to like change human nature so much in this way, not everyone is on board with these technologies. So one particular group that you highlight calls themselves human. That's H-U men for heavily unplugged men. And they're kind of an extremist, sometimes terroristic anti-technology group. They they overlap with the QAnon and anti-fax folks that we have today. And their most extreme members live off grid in like these tiny homes and are, as I said, sometimes do like terroristic acts. I'm just curious what the AGI systems in your world think of these folks. Like, is it a priority to try to de-radicalize them or bring them into the fold? So I am crediting Susan for this because Susan is a big fan of this book, Radicals by Jamie Bartlett. Mm. And in the in that book, he you know discusses that there are different radical groups that have existed all across time and space. And radicals can go from you know, sort of evangelicals to sort of transhumanists. So these these groups exist and have exist. And oftentimes they exist because they're demonstrating a symptom of where the status quo is failing mm. and it's not working for everyone. So even though they can offer visions of the future, they are often flawed and dystopian, but they still are sort of telling us about what is going on and what we need to be critical of. So kind of getting people to think more critically. I mean, obviously, you know, I think there's there's something where we can compare it to today where we do have like the anti-vaxxer folks. And so thinking about, well, why do they not feel that vaccines are, you know, safe? Yeah. What what where are we failing in society that these people don't feel like this is something that's for them? Yeah. Kind of taking it as feedback rather than a challenge to to neutralize. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. So it it ties back to us being like, well, we don't want to take away free will, so you know that's sort of a trade off of giving people free will is that you will have these radical groups emerge. Interesting. This team has deep expertise in understanding human interactions with technology, and they've clearly spent a lot of time thinking about how new tools might impact individuals as well as society at large. I was curious to hear their thoughts on current discussions around issues like inclusive AI development, data privacy, and the potential for AI tools to replace human creative labor. A major theme in your world is this focus on the unpredictable kind of trickle-down impacts of AI systems across society. And you show how AI tools don't need to be incredibly powerful or develop their own agency or anything in order to be really transformative. You have these really pretty simple innovations that have unexpected impacts on different people. Um, This is especially true for minority groups that aren't being considered during development. So what are your thoughts on the current discussions around diversity and accessibility in AI? I'm sure you have many of them. (laughs) I'd love to hear. Yeah. Yeah, so many. Yeah, I think Tashi mentioned this uh, in conversation that currently, like in AI, 
diversity often means how can we get different people to be more like us rather mm. than like how can we learn from others to be more like them so there's a lot of diversity going on for the sake of selling more products or just having yeah more people in a diverse tech team but when they're in that diverse tech team they're not necessarily able to bring their whole diversity self they are just having to like uh, assimilate to mm. um to mm -hmm. like what what the tech world is like and i guess it kind of well it kind of comes back to what we were saying before that inclusivity is really hard accessibility is hard like and we just like sticking a rainbow flag on something is not really <laughs> yeah. is not really what we need to do we need to like constantly question ourselves and realize that yeah that sometimes there are groups which have opposing views and then trying to like manage that conflict is also quite difficult so i think it's also something that is becoming more of a discussion i think particularly since the black lives matter movement mm. is thinking about equity and not equality so really trying to move towards what is equity and understanding how to actually create that. I was recently reading an article about there was sort of this organization or nonprofit organization that was created by a black woman and a white woman. And the black woman eventually was like, I can't be a part of this organization. You're not treating me equitably. Mm -hmm. And it kind of became in the articles that I was reading a very much a she said, she said kind of thing. and. To identify myself, I am a white woman from the U.S. And so I, in reading that article, was like, huh, well, what, how would I react? What, what, what is the, the issue here? And I think what I recognize is that, you know, when there's someone who's traditionally not in a position of power and they ask for something to be heard, um, it needs to be honored sort of the first time they're asked mm -hmm. because if I'm asking for equitable pay or I'm saying that like this maybe isn't great, even if I'm asking it in a nice way and it seems like I'm asking for a discussion, that's kind of been allowing and perpetuating these microaggressions that people are constantly facing. So I think it is sort of when we're thinking about creating these tools and developing to ensure that there's more outcomes for more diverse users, thinking about how we can listen yeah. and create equity so you're kind of saying like the the barriers to being heard and to expressing yourself in a safe way for some people are just much higher and so we should be kind of turning mm -hmm. up the gain on that feedback from them yeah yeah for yeah. sure thinking about people who are or who have been historically in power or given positions of power being more hyper aware of the work that they need to be doing yeah. How would you challenge people who are developing AI tools to think differently about, about that work to ensure better outcomes for all their users? There's several aspects to this. So there's firstly, create a team, a developer team that's diverse and doesn't only mm -hmm. represent one type of person. Then the second part is, but also leveraging that and letting developers bring in those diverse views. Yeah. And then, I mean, obviously you can't always have a developer team that represents every single section of society, but you can also like, like in our, our research, there are other ways of engaging with communities like participatory design, um, like just engage with the end users and issues they might see with whatever you're, you're designing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a kind of a limitation that we faced being from academia. So I think like both me and Vanessa are our PhD students. So there's a lot of time and sort of energy that can be put into looking at users and doing user research that I think because we oftentimes are sort of creating these technologies from a consumer standpoint, from a capitalist standpoint, there is less time that's given to user needs and understanding people. So in some ways we need to change that sort of culture that occurs in tech industries. But yeah, it's tough. Yeah. So if I can try to summarize, I guess I'm hearing <laughs> to listen more and to be prepared to truly be challenged and, and take these perspectives into account in their development work. Yeah, 
Um, and <laughs> <laughs> did I listen good? <laughs> yeah, you did yeah, great. You, did, you listened great. Um, awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, one one other thing I would say is understanding the context that you're building something in and questioning sometimes if AI is the right tool. So I think mm. sometimes it's kind of like that hammer and a nail story, you know, like when you've got hammer, everything looks like a nail. And sometimes that's what AI feels right now. Like we've got AI and there's a problem. How can we fix this problem with AI instead of understanding where the problem comes from? Because the AI might just be like a band-aid for a bigger structural issue that kind of lies underneath it. Or sometimes there might be like an easier fix that doesn't require AI. So I think treating AI more preciously sometimes mm. um, instead mm. of just thinking um, every problem needs AI as a fix. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I want I want to be a total millennial and be like, ah, oh, snaps for <laughs> Vanessa. This is great. Um, because it, it's very much like, I think even just technology in general, people are like, ooh, technology will fix everything. Technology is the answer. And then like, I do a lot of community-based research, so community-based participatory design. And so I'm working with people and oftentimes technology is not what they yeah. need. They need policy changes. They need, they need better transportation. They need like resources that governments need to be able to give them. But, you know, technology will yeah, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. That, that brings me around to the human group in your world. And again, I really appreciate how you're, you're really kind of living what you're saying in your world about taking these fringe groups as feedback. You know, this group is extreme and sometimes they're terroristic and that is obviously a huge problem, but nonetheless, their concerns are showing us something real about the world. And one of those concerns that people really take seriously is this conversation that develops around data ownership and consent, because a lot of the basic necessities in your world, like just like accessing goods and using a passport are monitored by AI systems. So this can make it really hard for people to operate with their privacy intact. You also talk about the other side of the coin where people who don't have data in the system who are attempting to like immigrate, for example, are discriminated against for being dataless because nothing is known about them. So I'm curious to hear more of your thoughts about current narratives around data privacy. Uh, I, uh, I have feelings about data privacy. Um, will you share them publicly? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, I, I guess I will. Uh, I mean, I think part of it is, is I am extremely guilty of everything that is bad. <laughs> We're being like, Aren't we oh, all? yeah, whatever. My data, I, no one's spying on me. Who cares? I don't, right, I don't right. have anything important. But I think it, it always, at least for me, comes back to my data is not concrete. I can't see it. So it means I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to know what's at stake until you have a problem. Until someone steals yeah, your data. Yeah, like, so that's my data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it was like my my mom had her identity stolen. Mm, I'm sorry. And well, I mean, I think it's actually pretty common and it's but it's awful. Yeah. And it's like you don't realize how much is at stake when you have your data stolen and how how much of your privacy is taken away until that sort of negative thing happens. Yeah. And I don't think in today's world, we really do a great job of explaining data privacy and what's being done with our data. Interesting. Yeah. And I think it's quite tiring for an end user to try to yeah. understand what is going on. I mean, we're in the school of computer science, but we don't know everything. I can't imagine how complicated it must be for a lay user. And that's kind of like the conflict that's in the human. Like on the one hand, you need the services to do things. But on the other hand, you don't have the time to engage with all the privacy fine print to understand if this is really what you want to give your data up for these things. So there's yeah, a lot of questions around like the accessibility of the language. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't I don't think we've got all the answers yet. Yeah. <laughs> not not personally or in the computer science world. Yeah. Well, on the sort of positive end of it, in your world, there's this trust index that a lot of democracies start using, which I think is loosely based on China's social credit system. And it's portrayed as this generally good thing that decreases isolation, increases trust. I'm curious how that relates to this broader discussion about data privacy. It's just, it's just like the good end of the spectrum. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's sort of one of those things that brings up allowing the question of who owns data and sort of who you trust with your data. And I think that's something that is still really underexplored. I think this is something that as being a researcher, I've become more aware of. And I think, well, being a researcher and being originally from the U.S. is being aware of where server farms mm. are and how that actually means someone else controls your data. So like oftentimes, I think, especially through universities, we're very strict about where you can store certain files or certain information. Yeah. And I think especially in the UK, things need to be on servers that are in Europe or in the UK. Mm. They can't be on servers in the US because the US government can potentially tap into those servers and see that huh. data. And I think that's something that like, I wouldn't have known yeah. <laughs> until I got into this because I would have thought, oh, yeah, if I use this website and, you know, the company's based in the U.S., it doesn't matter. My data saved in the yeah. cloud. It's saved wherever. Um, and I think that there's definitely this disconnect that is happening and potentially needs to be remedied in some yeah. way. It sounds like in general, you're calling for more kind of transparency and like concreteness of these discussions. Like what is the data? Where is the data? And like what's mm. at stake if it's taken? It does seem very kind of abstract to me as well when I think about these issues. Yeah, I think that's definitely my point of view. I don't want to speak necessarily for sure. everyone else on the team. <laughs> <laughs> Another theme you explored that I really appreciated was AI's relationship with the arts. You have a really nuanced portrayal of this. So things don't go well at first. The creative sector gets devalued and AI starts being criticized for kind of just making cookie cutter predictive media that people will like. But eventually AI systems get better and they start to make genuine contributions to culture, like new types of creative work. Um, and human creative work also starts regaining value because handmade items start coming back into vogue. So there's this strong demand for what you call slow creative labor. And AI facilitated tracking tools also help people get credit for their work when they have like bit parts and different forms of media. So overall, at the end of this arc, it feels to me like the creative sector actually does kind of better than a lot of other parts of the labor market in your world. And I'm curious if this was meant as kind of like a rebuttal to the current sense of pessimism about AI's impacts on creative work. I think for me, yes, I want to say yes. Um, I know that like Susan's work has engaged with, you know, sort of questions over the past year, looking at this program called Creative Informatics and sort of investigating how data driven innovation can broadly, you know, support the creative industries and support creative practitioners. Mm -hmm. And I think Tashi also does that, too, with the music realm. And I think me. So my background is art and design, and I studied traditional arts of Japan. And so I spent two years in Japan working on no masks and learning the art of no mask creation. What is that? Um, and I think, what is no yeah. mask? <laughs> no is um, a Japanese theater that basically it's, uh, if you've heard of Kabuki, yes, yes. it's similar to Kabuki, but with masks. Right. Um, it is not for everyone. Uh, I particularly like the masks for sort of their creepy elements. Yeah, they're kind of like strong grimaces um, and they tend to be kind of white painted. Yeah. Is that I'm imagining the right thing? Yes, okay. exactly. That's exactly I love it. This. But I think part of that and part of, I think, something we can learn from how the Japanese preserve their arts and cultures mm. um, is something that I think really sort of influenced thinking about the future of art and craft. I think even though a lot of handicrafts seem to be dying off and they seem to be being replaced by sort of automation and sort of mass production. There still really is this love of keeping these crafts alive. And there is sort of this need for governments to support handicrafts. Yeah. Interesting. So that, that kind of cultural value gives it more of a lasting power than like, you know, manual labor. Like there isn't so much of that yeah. for like hand washing your dishes and your clothes. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And and even to think of like the arts and crafts movement that occurred, there has been over time through arts sort of this supporting and need to build up and support the like handmade and handcraft. Yeah. So there's always this sort of dialogue and conversation that goes on in art. Very cool. The process
process of world building has great potential to make a positive future feel more attainable. This can be incredibly powerful, whether you're a creative person looking to produce rich works of fiction, or have a more technical focus and are looking to reach policymakers or the public. I asked Elaine and Vanessa what kind of impact they hoped their work would have on the world. Which aspects of your world would you most like to see popular media take on? Yeah, I think what we were continuously saying throughout <laughs> throughout today <laughs> was just kind of the um, the diversity part. So just yeah. not focusing on like the tech bro story or like the what will the rich people do once they can fly from one building to the other in their like <laughs> autonomous drones, but also mm. thinking about the stories that seem to be smaller but actually maybe mm. sometimes more common <laughs> um, yeah. like the day-to-day -day in in all the corners of the world yeah the indonesian grandpa yeah yeah <laughs> yeah the older the younger people and everyone mm. in between yeah well and i i think this is something that nicola pointed out is that thinking about you know maybe the more cooperative opportunities that can arise with new tech. So instead of thinking about technology as competition, and I think this is very relevant to how we're looking at AI right now is like this competition, who's going to have the strongest AI right. first, because it's almost become an arms race, but thinking of, well, how can we collaborate and sort of build better technology through cooperation? Mm. Yeah. And I guess, kind of seeing AI as like the side character of what we're creating and as the character that is interacting with humans. Yeah. The human centered. Yeah. I like that. What kinds of expertise would you be most interested in having people bring to these discussions? Well, none of us are economists, so <laughs> the feasibility of our world is something we would definitely need some economists to sort of look at and be like, eh. <laughs> like, I think I, I think especially with like UBI, like universal basic income, that's definitely something that it's like, well, we read some articles yeah, right. <laughs> and it looks really Everyone good and people have said it's good. <laughs> um but also there's there's a lot of political interdependencies mm -hmm. and sort of economic interdependencies that occur that can be like, I mean, anytime we have a depression in any economy, there definitely is global impacts to that. So I think we we need more people thinking about that aspect also of technology. Yeah. And what about um, in discussions about like how to develop AI systems, what sorts of voices or backgrounds would you want to to kind of bolster in those areas i guess basically the non-tech obsessed people mm -hmm. um the the people who are used and affected more than the people who just want to create and want to sell it yeah it's kind of a catch-22 it's like that thing from douglas adams like the only person who should be allowed to be a leader is the one who doesn't want to be <laughs> you need people yeah. who don't really care about ai yeah. development <laughs> yeah. That's tough. yeah and, and it is yeah it is difficult because you i guess that's a difficulty in user research as well that you're mm -hmm. taking or accessibility research probably uh, that you're taking the time from people who have other things to do and mm -hmm. um yeah. other things to worry about and so yeah it definitely needs to be done in a way that benefits them as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's tough. I think you're raising really interesting and more fundamental problems that I'm asking about. I'm like, which voices do need to be like added into this? And you're kind of saying, well, there's a lot of structural issues that make it hard for those voices yeah. to get found and included. And <laughs> like, So maybe maybe the feedback is more like we should be using some of these um, like design research and, and audience research approaches to actually like find ways to co-develop the technologies that work for the people we're trying to hear from. Yeah. But also I think a point that Vanessa is making is compensation. Mm -hmm. So I think we often go and I know academics are guilty of this. We often go into these populations and are like, tell us about you, tell us about what you want and what you need. And then we go, and here's a five pound voucher to some yeah. random place <laughs> that you've never been to. And it's like, that's not helpful. Yeah. So I think we need to get these voices heard, but we also need to recognize that there is this sort of equity that needs to be created where it's like, you know, 
we're compensating you for your time. We're compensating you for, you know, your opinions, like all of these sort of things. And not just monetarily, like also thinking about just other ways that we can compensate. Yeah. And some of the hidden costs probably of of sharing mm-hmm. and taking the time. Yeah. What do you hope that your world leaves people thinking about like long after they've read it? I guess the hope is that people will think more critically about everything, about the systems, about the technology, but then also recognizing that, you know, everyone needs to be a part of this. And so it's not just, we don't want just the people that are hyper tech focused and working on technology involved. It's very much like voting. You think that like you're one person, your vote doesn't matter, but in actuality, it's like, no, if you and everyone else thinks like that, then it does affect things. So it's very much getting everyone involved and making sure that everyone is thinking about this. Mm. Yeah. And if they they read our thing and they kind of didn't imagine to hear the stories that we told about places that we kind of focused on, then maybe question like, so when you're thinking about the future and what the future looks like, like whose voice is narrating this story? Mm. Like who is telling this story and who is included in that future? And I can see that even some people who are imagining a futuristic scene wouldn't even think about what their like own story in yeah, this well, whole thing is. But I think, yeah, that's what we'd like people to think about. Well, this has been a really great conversation. I really appreciate all the perspectives and insights that you guys have shared. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you. It was, it was fun talking. If this podcast has got you thinking about the future, you can find out more about this world and explore the ideas contained in the other worlds at www.worldbuild.ai. We want to hear your thoughts. Are these worlds you'd want to live in? If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to help more people discover and discuss these ideas, you can give us a rating or leave a comment wherever you're listening to this podcast. We read all the comments and appreciate every rating. This podcast is produced and edited by Worldview Studio and the Future of Life Institute. FLI is a nonprofit that works to reduce large scale risks from transformative technologies and promote the development and use of these technologies to benefit all life on Earth. We run educational outreach and grants programs and advocate for better policymaking in the United Nations, US government, and European Union institutions. If you're a storyteller working on films or other creative projects about the future, we can also help you understand the science and storytelling potential of transformative technologies. If you'd like to get in touch with us or any of the teams featured on the podcast to collaborate, you can email worldbuild at futureoflife.org. A reminder, this podcast explores the ideas created as part of FLI's world building contest. And our hope is that this series sparks discussion about the kinds of futures we all want. The ideas we discuss here are not to be taken as FLI positions. You can find more about our work at www.futureoflife.org or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates on all our projects. Thanks for listening to Imagine a World. Stay tuned to explore more positive futures. Mm-hmm.